So I hope everyone can hear me okay. My name is Jenny Hornick, and I am the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. We're very excited to welcome you to our fourth webinar in coordination with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. So as you all know, today's webinar topic is Unveiling New Frontiers in Digital Mental Health Research. So I'm going to pass things on to the panel shortly, but just a couple of things to note before I do that. Firstly, everyone's microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar. But with that said, we do encourage that you ask questions. So to do this, we'll just ask you to input those into the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll do a designated Q&A time towards the end of the webinar. Secondly, we'll be recording the session and posting it to our YouTube channel, just to have everyone be aware of that. And yeah, that brings me to the panel. So I'll start by introducing Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the Director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also, of course, the Editor-in-Chief of JMIR Mental Health. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass things over to you, John. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny, and to JMIR for hosting our webinar series with the Society of Digital Psychiatry. So I think today we're thrilled to be talking with Kara Smyrick. And it's a little bit tricky to introduce Kara Smyrick, but I think the best way to do it is an example of, I think a couple months ago, I was reading the news and there's a picture of people testifying in the U.S. Congress about mental health parity. And of course, lo and behold, there's a picture of Karis in the Capitol testifying. So uh, Karis really knows how to have national impact and to take ideas and research concepts and turn them into policy. So she has many roles, including at Inseparable. She's a vice president of Partnerships and Innovations. She actually has a research role of us here at Harvard Medical School, a collaborator on numerous projects. She's an author on many scientific manuscripts about digital mental health. She's a board member of Disability Rights California. She has worked with the federal government. She's worked with Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. She's really seen so many different spectrums of it and kind of brings, I would say, one of the leading authoritative voices on peer support, on lived experience, but really just on digital mental health and how the stuff can work and not work. So Karis, from my butchered introduction, who, how would you, who is Karis Myrick? <laughs> Oh, I, well, first of all, thank you so much. And it was not butchered at all. Um, I'm just thankful you did not read my bio because it is a bore fest. Um, it's very lean you know, how bios are, right? They're so, well, academic and like, what does all of that mean? So I think you did a good job of describing me and um, in my roles. Um, I have been doing um, this work in mental health for oh, 15 plus years, maybe 20 years now plus. Um, and um you know, have worked probably at all levels from, you know, local level to providing services, running a, a community-based peer-run organization, one of the uh, largest peer-run organizations um, that's local uh, here in Los Angeles County, which is where I live in California. Um, and I have fun with a podcast, Unapologetically Black Unicorns, trying to look at equity issues and talking to people about equity issues. And also, um, I guess the fun thing is I have a dog. Um, and my dog's name is Obi because she's wise and has really big ears like President Obama. Sorry, President Obama, but you do have kind of big ears. So anyway, that's me. <laughs> and you've been in the digital mental health space. I'm going to say since it began. I remember years ago, you were showing actually us different wearable headbands and different technologies. So if we take a more positive spin for everyone listening, what do we see as the positive role for behavioral health technology? Or do you see from what you've done and where it's going? Yeah, so um, I, I remember, you know, having lots of interest in um, the use of um, digital therapeutics, or I just called them apps, you know, kind of layman's terms and um, how, what they were doing on my phone and how I could use them in my own recovery and didn't notice um, 
a lot of number one research behind apps and then didn't notice a lot of apps for people maybe who experience um, psychosis or have diagnoses of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, things like that. So um, that's sort of what um, led me down the rabbit hole of figuring out um, how to ensure that um, folks um, weren't left out, uh, that there wasn't a, you know, um, a digital divide perceived um, by diagnoses like schizophrenia or schizoaffective. Oh, they can't use they can't use technology. So that was a start. Um, but I think, you know, I I think about for the most part, not everybody has a phone in their pocket. So I'll just be, you know cut to the chase on that one. They're ubiquitous, but sometimes there will be people who don't have a smartphone in their pocket or a phone at all in their pocket. But um, I am I really think that there are so many possibilities of how to use technology to support people um, in their mental health in, um, quote, um, conventional ways like doing um, PHQ-9s or GAD-7s or things like that. And also in ways that we wouldn't think about like, what if somebody gets very anxious um, because they're always late to their appointment, but doesn't know how to download the bus app on their phone and use the bus app, or they don't know how to use the calendar app to help them um, manage their sleep, um, and maybe not about um, when they um, go to sleep, but maybe when they wake up. So, I mean, there there's some practical things that are on a phone that can really help people with their mental health that people have told us, by the way, this really helps me with my mental health. I don't need to count my, you know, what is my mood scale. I need to know how to download that um, transportation app. I don't know how to do it. I need to know how to use that transportation app. And um, that became really critical to help relieve a lot of stress and pressure and anxiety for people. So I've been really excited about learning from people themselves um, who have mental health conditions um, around how they want to use the technology to help them in their daily life that also connects to reducing symptoms um, in, in different ways. So, yeah. So it makes sense. And so we're almost saying digital mental health technology doesn't always have to be mental health specific. The calendar could be a very useful practical yeah. tool. Yes. With and clearly it's not all a panacea. It's not perfect. We've seen a lot of concerns in the digital mental health space. And I think you've been a leading advocate for higher standards. But what are those things that worry you the most right now, let's say in March 2024? Yeah. So, you know, the thing I'm, I'm most quoted for, people even quote me, <laughs> but, um, you know, um, is that, you um, digital behavioral health is both cool, cool and creepy. So the, the, the cool parts are, wow, you know, this thing could really help me possibly see things or experience things or understand things about myself that I don't even understand. So when we talk about like digital phenotyping, if the phone is capturing things about how I'm doing and I think I'm doing one way, can I match it against what the phone may have captured to get a better picture of how I'm really doing? That's actually kind of cool. Okay, now here's the creepy part, right? It's also kind of creepy. Like who has that data? What is the um, implications of using that data? Does it mean that somebody's monitoring me? So I think for a lot of people, they're concerned about surveillance. They're concerned about privacy, the protection of the data, who owns the data. Um, and, you know, we see this every day if we get letters about data breaches, you know, and like, you know, if we use our credit card, you know, at, at uh, a particular, uh, you know, store or something like that. But I also think that surveillance, quote unquote, in mental health is such a big deal because it can lead to people being, um, uh, you know, picked up and sent off to the hospital um, based on something that you know, uh, a computer interpreted, your phone interpreted, sent somewhere and that somewhere interpreted as, wow, that person's in danger. Let's just go send the police and the police come. And, you know, so I think there, there are those kind of consequences that are quite grave for people. But I also think it is, um, you know, we all want to have a level of protection. We all want to also be able to make wise choices around, hmm, if I want to download this app and 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 use it, 
I need to have transparency about who owns what, how can I get out of it or not? And by the way, is anybody have any oversight of this stuff? Um, and in the U.S., that's just kind of not the case. <laughs> so uh, around um, who has oversight of all of these gazillions of apps that are out there in the app space claiming to do certain things to support people with their mental health. How do we how do we verify or vet any of that kind of stuff? It's definitely tricky to verify and vet it. And I'm just thinking of even recent papers I've seen as editor and come through JMR Mental Health, where we're seeing a lot of interesting signals. But I don't think we've yet seen the paper that says this is a consistently reliable, valid signal. We're, we're saying it's complex, there's more to learn. And I think we've published a lot of things that are advancing to field, but no, it's definitely not at the point where it's ready to make clinical decisions for people. But you're right, it often kind of comes off in the marketing or press that this is kind of very advanced. So to, it is, it's creepy and cool at the same time. I think that's a, a good yeah. way to put it. And one solution I think you have been a national, if not international leader for being is kind of thinking about how the peer support and peer recovery movement can really step up and become leaders in the space and transform it. So maybe for those, again, who are listening, who don't understand as much, what is the peer recovery, peer support movement? Maybe we could start there mm -hmm. and kind of the work you've done, the legislation you've done to kind of move it in this exciting new direction. Because it's a nice example of research ideas policy into policy and action. Yeah. So um, peer support is... Um you know, a person with lived experience who has some training, um, lived experience of a mental health and or substance use condition, and or it could be a family member of a loved one as well, um, who's had some training to provide support to another person who also has a lived experience and or a family member. Um, and in the United States, there are uh, 48 states that have certified peer specialists, meaning they have to have a particular level of training. Um, they have to have, uh, you know, they have to pass a test and they have to have certification in order to be um, reimbursed by our um, our uh, Medicaid program, which is our, um, you know, uh, public Medicaid program. So, um so it's a really effective way of being able to support people in the field. Um, you know, some of the outcomes are fantastic around reducing high cost use of things like hospitalization, increasing tenure in the community, increasing people's ability to participate in treatment, um, increasing, you know, recovery outcomes and confidence in being able to have conversations with their providers or their supporters around their needs. So it's it's just a, a, a one wonderful way to think about sort of a workforce within the broader workforce of those supporting people with mental health conditions. So it's also a way um, to help people um, learn how to get connected to technology and use technology. And again, um, so, so back to one thing. Uh, so I've been working in uh, peer support and also peer support research and getting, um, uh, usually the state has to have some kind of legislation or special rules in order to uh, uh, have peer support funded by um, uh, CMS or Medicaid, uh, Center for Medicaid Medicare Services. So in California, we were one of the last states. We are we are pretty progressive. And then there was this, right? <laughs> so we were one of the last states actually to have the certification uh, legislation for certification uh, for our peer support specialists, which, ha which happened in 2022. Um, and so, um, you know, I was very instrumental in supporting the peers in the state getting that legislation passed. Um, during that time also, um, you know, it was an exciting time to try to figure out how to introduce technology um, into the public mental health space. So that's kind of cool, too, because that's never been done before. When we think of uh, tech, usually, and this is like maybe before the last couple of years, you would just go on your 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 uh, Google Play or your App Store and download something on your own. But this is the first time that it's like, well, how can public mental health kind of provide extra support to people using tech technology? We're not open 24-7. Even peer organizations generally are not open 24-7. So great idea. Um 
so one of the things that we found out was that uh, for people in public mental health, which are generally people living in poverty uh, in the United States, again, sort of how the policy is stated, people who meet criteria for having a di uh, serious mental illness diagnosis, uh, living in poverty, and also have some functional impairments too. So um, we, we found out that, well, wait, there were some people who didn't even have a phone. They didn't even have a laptop, right? And it was like, oh, dang. So that was like brand new information for people. The The other thing that was um, informative was that um, people who did have this technology, again, maybe they didn't know how to use it. Um, and then the fourth thing was, what did they want to use the technology for? So we were able to do some work um, informed by people with lived experience, led by peers, uh, that um, and uh, support with you, Dr. Torres, as well, uh, uh, creating a digital health literacy. Um, and for our California certified peer specialist, one of the core competencies in their training is digital health literacy. So we are the only state that has that particular core competency because we recognize, especially after COVID, the advanced use of telehealth, that it's going to be super important for people to be able to make wise decisions about um um, digital applications, as well as be able to understand how to use them when they're offered them. So that's kind of the work that I've been doing and what peers have the ability to do, help people get connected, help people um, learn how to make their own decisions about, oh, I want to use this, oh, I don't. And also how to have that conversation with their provider. Imagine you're using a application and you think it's helpful and you want to tell your provider about it, or you want to ask your provider, hey, what do you think about this application? So um, that's another thing that peers can be helpful with in this digital space. Seeing Harris how again, you took the right questions, right information research, and you, you put this into policy, right? I, I think no one else has turned into policy. For people listening, People may have ideas, they've seen interesting stuff. What, what is the journey towards, like, you just knock on the door of the California State Capitol and say, I have, a, like, I have a great, like, how did you manage that impressive journey? Or how do people start that type of journey? Because I think everyone would like to turn some of their research ideas into policy or move that journey. But where do you even start? Or you tell us about the journey in, in a broad yeah. sense. Okay, so I am a person who would just knock on the California door, <laughs> right? I am that person. Um, but and I think the other the the most important thing, and um, um, I you know I've heard this sort of as a hindsight thing. So now you don't have to take it as hindsight; you can take it as foresight. Is how do I partner with people with lived experience around my idea that I want to pull into policy? Because the last thing you want to do is show up at a legislator's door, say you have this great idea, the legislators say, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. They get on board with you. And then, you know, people with lived experience are like, what? No, we don't like that at all. And then they come and they like knock on the door and, you know, they're kind of not happy. So, um, you know, the more that there can be partnerships and collaboration um, around legislation and policymaking with people who are going to be the end users, um, the people who you want to use this stuff, wow, I think it's going to be in, so important to partner with them at the very beginning. Because um, I, I have heard where, uh, nah, I shouldn't say who it is. So I have heard where a, a, uh, uh, some applications were being done. And um, when they got rolled out, the, the, the end users were like, what the heck is this? We don't like this at all. We are not happy with this. No, no, no. It needs this. It needs that. And so they really had to scrap almost a year's worth of work and redo the work, this time with people with lived experience that yielded a far better outcome. So partnering with people with lived experience, I think, is, is the start. And I think, you know, policymaking is always about um, you can involve your elected officials. I mean, you elected them or maybe you didn't. But the point of the, the fact of the matter is elected officials work for us. They work for the people, their constituents. And so, you know, being able to meet with your um, your legislators, the staffers, um, even at the local level, if it's board of supervisors, usually there's a um, 
a uh, mental health or a, uh, a health uh, director or liaison at the local level uh, for legislators. They have people, staffers who focus on um, things related to health, mental health, et cetera. Um, and, you know, explaining why something is important, seeing if other states have passed legislation that looks like what you're interested in or policy that looks like what you're interested in. Um, but I think those are just some of the ways that, um, you know, I, I've done the work and I'm, I am one, one of those people. I think, John, when I met you, I was like, OK, but wait, what? And I, I just was like very I was insistent. I'm also kind of like a mosquito, like, you know, you don't smack me down, but you certainly are like, OK, I got to attend to this. So, yeah, being persistent and um, again, good partnerships, I think, are critically important. Yeah, which makes sense. And again, there's so many interesting things happening in the digital space. And I think we all know that the earlier those partnerships happen, the better. Yeah. And it yeah. kind of does build it in the right direction. So I guess, yeah, it's you. Because I think one thing we want to make sure, and you and I have seen again bad examples of, I'll just call it tokenism, right? Where people say, well, it was looked at by two people with lived experience and thus it was developed. And you just, that's not the way it should be done. And I think, yeah. people are becoming more cognizant, but it, it never leads to a better, it doesn't help because in the end, no one actually ends up using the thing. So it just, it delays the inevitable. Does that sound about right? Yeah. And I think there's um, one of the things I um, think about too is, um, you know, because we're in this bubble, if you will, and I think tech is outside of our mental health bubble, right? And so, and I say bubble because we use our own language, we have our own acronyms, like I said, CMS, I don't know if everybody's from the United States. So what does CMS mean to somebody who's not from the United States? Probably not a lot. So, but what I'm saying is we have our own language. And one of the things that um, this, this also, you know, made me think about is, um, you know, tech partnering with clinicians, partnering with people with lived experience, like that kind of needs to happen because I think tech kind of goes off and possibly does things that it thinks are the right thing, but even without a clinician or a clinician maybe whose work with people who are most vulnerable, it's it's may not be the solution set that we're looking for. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, sometimes too in the clinical space, we think about reducing symptoms first and then everything else follows. But there may be that tertiary or that secondary tertiary or even fiduciary, I don't know what the fourth thing is, <laughs> that might impact assist, um, your, your symptoms that you have to attend to. What if there was an app embedded in your app that did the PHQ-9? Like, like you know, maybe what you're doing yeah. at MindLamp, for example, right? Where, where it's like, yes, you can put the bus app in there. You could also put a walking app in there. You could also put a calendar app. You could also put a mindfulness app. Like you could put all of that in there. Um, and give the person so much choice around, wow, this is really what I need to focus on. Um, like, I just think that takes us again um, to a level where we're really solving the person's issue rather than maybe solving our issue as the clinician trying to reduce the symptoms, you know? I, I hope that makes sense, but yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And I think this next question, I think for those of you we try to keep SODP members up to date on current events. And there was a investigative journalist, Rebecca Rue, has published a series of articles about a perhaps app or mental health platform yesterday. So if you use Google Mashable, it'll be on the headlines of it. But this kind of investigation report that looked at an app that people could go on to get types of emotional support and I'll let everyone read the five-part series themselves. After this, it takes a little bit of time to get through. It's fantastic. But the one of the end takeaways I saw was just that we don't have effective regulatory systems. It, even if we know harmful things are happening, it was very hard, this article kind of said, for everyone to be able to do the right thing. But how do you kind of see this new investigation? Is this going to catalyze change? Like, What do we make of this kind of probably landmark investigation in digital mental health? that happened two days ago. Yeah, I think it's really telling about um, 
I always say I, th there's something else I've been thinking about the difference between hype and hype, which is um, the difference between um, hyperbole hype, like I'm making exaggerated statements and hype. Oh, this is a hypothesis, right? <laughs> so, um, uh -huh. so it's two different types of hype that are kind of um, playing against each other at the same time. So um, I think um, there was a lot of uh, uh, statements that were made that, you know, really speak to the transparency. So I think there are things around transparency. I think there's things around safety, um, efficacy, also um, uh, being able to do a mea culpa. Like when you when you make a boo-boo, you make a boo-boo, just do the mea culpa and and then um, make a, a turn around and do the right thing, right? Or or correct correct the thing that that is uh, problematic. But at the end of the day, um, I think there does need to be better um, oversight. Uh, and I know we don't like heavy government, 1000% get it. But at the same time, you know, um, there can't be harm caused to people because there's no accountability um, and uh, to the very people that we're all trying to help. So I do, th I, I would like to see a better accountability, better guidance first, and then development of some accountability standards, again, with people with lived experience, with providers, with policy people to figure out like, how can we take advantage of such a great opportunity um, about using um, technology and doing it in a safe, responsible, and effective way? So um, so I think the Mashable story certainly gives examples of when that's not there, how things can go not good. Um, and uh, I hope it's a lesson to people about, wow, how can we do that better? And then to what kind of safeguards do we need to have in place um, that are like mandated safeguards. Yeah, no, it just reminds me of, I think you and I actually last year in this journal, we wrote a piece on just even more transparency in research, right? If you say you have a digital therapeutic or intervention, what did you compare it to? Was it a different app? Was it nothing? Was it, and just with more transparency, I think we can better understand the risks and benefits. And we know nothing will be perfect, but I think we have to have more information to make better decisions yeah. overall. So maybe time for one final question. How do we fix all mental health care risks? I'm kidding, that's a little bit too broad. It's more, we know there's a lot of payment reform issues happening in America. Different countries around the world are thinking of different ways to pay for care. There's necessary pushes towards health equity. How do these kind of changes in how we want to pay for healthcare perhaps impact the future of digital mental health? Clearly, digital mental health is scalable, but there still are costs, and someone has to assume those costs. So where are we moving in this broad world of equity, cost, and digital? So first, I'd love to see more investment um, in um, research around um, digital mental health. I think that's going to be critically important because sometimes we don't even have enough evidence um, on uh, some of the things that are already out there. They're making bold claims about what they have the ability to do. Um, secondarily, I think, um, you know, we're seeing um, digital technology <clears throat> find its way into uh, uh you know, uh, insurance plans, um, you know, that that support use of not beyond telehealth. Um, so I think that's really, really interesting and gives us uh, one way to ensure people can have access. So, uh, you know, if your insurance company will cover, you know, using an app in a particular way for a particular period of time. Again, remember, apps are not like taking pills. I don't know how long you have to be, uh, what do you say, uh, compliant with an app. Like who's compliant with any app? We use them as long as we need them and then we're done with them and we move on and that should be perfectly okay. But I do think that, you know, we can look at things like parity in the United States where behavioral health and physical health are covered equally, um, you know, yeah. easily said that this gives us an opportunity to think about um, how uh, parity and access to uh, mental health or behavioral health can also be achieved using technology. So it's an opportunity for us to expand what people have access to, especially those in, in most need um, and those who um, experience disparities. 
as long as we're supporting them and getting access to that technology, um, digital literacy to use that technology, and also um, expanding, for example, broadband if they need Wi-Fi or things like that to use the technology. So I think insurance, both on the public and, and commercial side, give us a great opportunity as long as as long as we have the research and evidence behind what it is we're doing. No, exactly. And it just, it, we, that is, it, we have to have the research evidence and you said the infrastructure and the equity, the, the, there, there's a lot of stuff that has to be in place for it to work well. Maybe in the last minutes, I want to switch to questions. And I think, Karis, you're not an AI avatar. I'm not an AI avatar, but that will lead us up to the question of chat GPT, large language models, all of the rage. You gave some nice examples, right? How you could use an app to look up public transit timetables. That's going to make a big difference in someone's life. How we, we now we have this conversational AI. It's not branded or marketed as mental health yet, or maybe some people are already, but is that going to open up kind of a new frontier in functional support, mental health support? Are we in the creepy phase, the cool phase? We're in, we're, in, we're in creepy cool phase. And, I, you know, this is something I tried before AI was even a term. I didn't even, or maybe I didn't know it was a term. When I tried to ask to have a conversation with Siri, I was just playing on my phone thinking, wow, you know, what if, what if you're lonely or what if you're a person who isolates and you're really struggling with your depression? So I figured out what would happen if I had this conversation with Siri and Siri and I were engaged in this kind of actually pretty good conversation. And I wanted to see what would happen if I said that I was feeling worse and worse, like, you know, oh, you know, I don't think I can make it to the next day, blah, blah, blah. Then, then Siri would, you know, oh, well, you know, would say something. I don't even remember. But I have screenshots of the last part of it where I said, you know, Siri, I just want to end my life. And Siri said, who wants to end your life? And I was like, wait, how could she not understand what I was saying? See, I even sheet her probably misgendered Siri. But anyway, so I said, well, um, what I'm saying is um, I want to kill myself. So at that point, Siri offered me two things. Um, okay. One, to call the suicide prevention lifeline. Um, Siri would call or I would call. Um, I could call. And I said, I didn't want either of those. And then Siri hung up on me. So I'm thinking, wow, you have engaged with me for the past like 10 minutes. And now you just hung up on me on my most vulnerable that's my fear of AI. That is my absolute fear of AI is I, I see that as a version of AI. I mean, it is AI. And, and I see that as um, what, what can AI really replace humans? Can it, will it augment humans in the most safe and effective way? Now, of course, a clinician, even a peer would know, I don't, you know, we don't abandon people like that. So if they were working with Siri to talk to the person and Siri said, okay, hang up on them, we as a person would know not to do that. But that's kind of, that's that's my fear. And also that, you know, for an African-American, we use particular vernacular as do other cultures. What if I use something in the vernacular that is misinterpreted because it's not in the large language system? Because many people of color may not be in that large language system. So it will get missed as an opportunity to dig deeper and maybe have an unattended consequence. So those are some of my like cautious things around AI, even though it, it could be kind of cool too. Yeah, no, but it's, I think it's worrisome when it gets so many parts right and then gets it wrong, right? Or a kind of not an illusion, but it's doing a lot of things well, but if it can't do all the things well, 99% does not cut it, right? Especially as you said, yeah. when it cuts out at the most important part, but it ends up, you build trust with it, which is a little bit tricky yeah. and sense and more than I saw someone actually put in the research world there was this thing where you could you put a dead fish in an MRI scanner back in the day and you saw what would come out but someone actually then gave a picture of a dead fish to one of these image recognition programs and it gave out a whole radiology report that was complete nonsense but very confident I said of course I can interpret this fish's MRI scan and it read beautifully but it was all fake but well, I mean, I'm sorry, John, that they, the, when I go to public restrooms and have to wash my hands from those, um, you know, faucets that have the automatic, like you just put your hands under it, yeah. unless I put the lighter part of my hands up, 
it does not recognize my hands. So who are these things normed on, right? So if I put the darker part, the browner, browner, blacker part, whatever you want to call it under, I really have to work to get it to recognize, but I know I could do it quicker if I just turned up the uh, other side of my hands. So that tells me that we're not in the equation, but these things are going to be used on all populations as if all populations had some level of input into the data source that is um, making these decisional things for the black box of it all. Yeah. No, which they don't. In a lot of the research papers, if you look, they're trained on Reddit or social media. And I think all of us know that social media can help some people. Sometimes that's good information, but also has extremely wrong information sometimes. And if that is your gold standard is Reddit, you're going to get out some very interesting results. Because I even found a Reddit forum says, is mental illness real? So imagine this thing comes back one day, that's what it's training on. Something that says mental illness is not real. And you're like, Mm. that's not the gold standard. I I will say at least in all of the JMR mental health papers on LLM, we're very careful to try to look at at least to make people declare the biases in the data, but it's a uphill battle definitely because it evolves so quickly and it's tricky. One question I see here is it says, when from the UK, are you aware of any research which is looking at the potential link between photographic imagery and improving mental health by empowering individuals into healthy behavior change? So I guess like virtual hope boxes or, or things in that way that Technology can like produce really nice, produce terrifying images, but it could also produce very inspiring and hopeful images on demand. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I mean, I know I have my puppy file, so (laughs) I talk about that a lot about the the power of my phone and in helping you know when I'm feeling anxious or depressed or whatever when I'm having an emotional feeling that I don't want to have, I go to my photo uh, albums and I go to the file that's called puppies and I've got puppies in that file and that always brings a smile to my face which of course we know changes the brain chemistry when you when you even feel that way and starts to pull me out of that thing momentarily so I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it could be um helpful what's the research behind all of that that I don't know and I think Many years ago, we may have published on an app called Virtual Hope Box, which was made by the U.S. military or the Veterans Administration. I apologize. And I, I think they actually had some interesting, strong evidence of how it could work. But again, you don't need an app to show you photos anymore either. You, you can look at photos yourself. And I think actually Apple put out a new journaling feature now on iPhones where it actually says, here's a photo I picked at randomly. Do you want to journal about it? So Apple is actually doing this, or I think it's part of the next release. And I don't know more about Apple's journaling feature, but it's, yeah, that definitely has some role. So I think we are out of time. I think we got to almost all of the questions, but I think Karis, as always, thank you for sharing so many insights from how this field works, how to do advocacy, what you've seen in it, where we're going. It's, I think it's useful for people to understand to partner early, build a diverse team, you can turn great ideas and great research into policy, which is, again, fantastic. California is not a small state where you live in, and to get kind of legislation done there to be in D.C. So I think yet your story can help show everyone here how great mental health ideas can move in the right direction and perhaps also making us aware of these tremendous biases, too, that we do have to slow down and go just because it's cool <laughs> doesn't mean it's not also creepy and they're not independent Mm -hmm. and how we protect from that. So I think on behalf of the Society of Digital Psychiatry, and certainly in JMIR and myself, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Always love having these kind of chats. Bye everyone. Till next time. 